It is an honor to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity by the elders to allow me to come and to be here this weekend. We had a great crowd of about 30 on Friday night, 20 or so yesterday, and uh, just really had a good time. And I hope that you will be back with us at 6 o'clock tonight, because that's going to be the most practical lesson. A lot of times people in the throes of grief will say, well, what can I do to help people? Well, tonight, that's what we're going to talk about. Ten things, but I have a list of 31 things that people in the throes of grief said. These were the things in those first few days, those first few hours <clears throat> that really helped a great deal. So we're going to be talking about that tonight, and I hope that you'll come back and that you'll want to be a part of that. I also, before I get into my lesson on grief, want to thank you for something that perhaps you may not even remember. But in May of 2008, I be began to serve as the executive director of the North Alabama Christian Children's Home. Two months later, the first Sunday of July, you allowed me to come and be the first place that I ever spoke. And I don't remember exactly how that all got started. I guess maybe it was through Thomas, maybe because his daddy, GB, was on the board, later on served as the, as the chairman of that board. So maybe that was the connection. But uh, uh, you were the first folks. And um, now over 350 plus places later, uh, I'll be uh, retiring later in May. I finish out to this month and then sort of be on retainer with them through May, through March, I should say. But uh, you started it. And on top of that, like I said, Brother Cochran, through the work of Thomas, I remember y'all brought uh, a roofing group and helped us out there at the Children's Home, and some of you are a part of that. Michael Cagle, uh, Brother Edmund's son, has a, been a longtime secretary for us, and he and Michelle are some of the best people in the world. And so we're blessed by what you have done through the years, and we can't thank you enough for that. Years ago, Zondervan Book Company decided that they would ask a question to their readers to see if they could get responses. The question was, if there was one question that you could ask God, what would it be? And they asked people to send them their, their statements. You can imagine what some of them would be. How long will I live? When will I die? What does heaven look like? But the number one question on the mind of those readers was, why do good people have to suffer? And that's certainly a notable question. And it's a question that was asked of Job and will be asked of anyone in the throes of grief. As Philip mentioned, grief is a very biblical subject in fact, the first use of the word is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 6, in regards to God. And his grief over the bad decisions that mankind was already making in that early world. And so it's something that God certainly was a part of. The word grief is found 24 times in the Old Testament. It's found only twice in the New Testament. It comes from a Greek word, gravis, which means heavy, and it suggests that idea. In the Indian world, I understand that their definition of the word grief is empty, and you can perhaps understand that idea. The word does use it in regards to death in the Bible, but it's also used in other interesting ways as well. For example, in Genesis chapter 26, verses 34 and 35, is used in reference to Isaac and Rebekah's reaction to their son Esau. They had chosen to go outside their family, outside their native people, and to marry a Hittite woman. And that marriage was a grief of mind to them because of the choice that had been made. It's also found in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 16. In regards to Hannah's inability to be able to have a child, you may recall that even though her husband loved her greatly and deeply, there in that temple, she was praying to God. Her lips were moving, but no words were coming forth. 
And you may recall that the priest there thought that she was drunk and suggested that she needed to get rid of her drunkenness. And she makes the statement, Do not count your handmaid as a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and my grief, I have spoken. There are some who know about that grief because they so desire to have a child, and yet they're not able to. At the children's home in the last 15 plus years, we've had 20, hopefully soon 23, that will, be, will have been adopted from us. And so we're grateful that they can have a new forever home in situations like that. And then thirdly, Solomon used the word grief in regards to the problems of life found in 2 Chronicles 6, verses 28 through 30. The fact of the matter is that we grieve over a lot of things besides death. We think of, think of only of that, but what about the loss of life? What do, we, what do we think about the loss of one's health? What do we think about the loss of a job, the loss of our home? Loss because of spiritual unfaithfulness. Children that grew up in the Lord's church and then make those decisions that are not in keeping with God's word. Lost because of moving. Or perhaps moving away from your church home and having to find a new church home in another city. Grief is so much a part of our life. And as I often say, grief comes in one size. Extra large. And in this room tonight, today, the greatest loss is yours, whatever it or whatever they may be. It is said that in life we are guaranteed to do two things, pay taxes and ultimately to die. Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, It's appointed to man once to die, and after this the judgment. And when God describes life, he never describes it in regards to eons of time. There's never the promise that we're going to live to a certain magical age and then we have to think about dealing with those issues. Job, he knew something about grief, said in Job chapter 7, verse 6, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Or again in Job chapter 14, verse 1, Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Again, this idea is found in 2 Samuel 14, verse 14, when he says, For we must all die, and are as water which is spilled on the ground which cannot be gathered again. And then James, the brother of our Lord, talked about it in James chapter 4, when he said, beginning with verse 13, Go to now, you that say, today or tomorrow, we'll go into a city. There we'll buy and we'll sell and we'll get gain. Whereas you don't even know what is on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even as a vapor, a mist, that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Thus we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. When death does come into our lives, there's going to be grief. It's one of the greatest emotions known to man. A very simple equation for grief is love plus loss equals grief. If I love someone or something and I lose someone or something, it is only natural that I feel the pain of that loss. Job sort of had an equation about it in Job chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. Through the mind of God, he said, Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed, my calamity laid in the scales together. They would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore, my words are swallowed up. We'll look at Job in just a few minutes, but think about all the losses that he dealt with. The loss not of one child, but of ten, his entire heritage. The loss of his health, the loss of his wealth, the loss of commerce, the inability to trade because his camels had been taken by the enemies. Perhaps even the loss of his wife who said, why don't you just curse God and die? 
He said, you put all those losses over here on one side and you put the sands of the sea on the other side and they would be heavier than the sands of the sea. It's interesting that God has made animals like hyenas that make the sound of laughter. And he's made trees that make the sound of groaning, but he's only made human beings with the capacity to do both. And there are times when we, in fact, will do both. Yesterday in our class, I gave them two words, and I encourage you to do the same thing. Write down on a piece of paper somewhere grief is, and then you fill in the blanks of what grief is to you because it may be different than others because it's your grief. This lady who was a part of my class from Athens years ago who had endured six different deaths in a 22-month period of time, put it this way. To me, grief is like being in a large room with no light, no window, and only one door, but it's locked. There is a key. I'm huddled in a corner all alone. Friends and family knock at the door. They talk to me. I hear them, understand their words, and recognize their voices. I do not respond because I'm numb. Soon their knocking ceases. They assume I am fine. I am not. On my knees, in prayer, I find the key that opens the door. The key is the Bible. I open the door. I'm in a tunnel. It's mostly dark, only a few streaks of light. As I go through the tunnel, light and darkness come and go. Now there's more light than there was darkness. My study of Proverbs and Psalms in particular have helped me. I will survive. He has promised me he will not leave or forsake us. With this introduction in mind, I want us to look at a few examples of grief found in the Bible. You might want to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12, where this is a different kind of loss. It's the loss where King David chose to go against the ways of God, not go out into the battlefield like he was supposed to do, but instead be back behind. He saw a beautiful woman taking a bath, and the end result was that he had sexual relations with her. She became expectant with child. It ends up being one of the soldier's wife that was out there in the battlefield. God sends Nathan the prophet and tells him, because of this terrible sin that you have committed, that child is going to die. Notice there in 2 Samuel chapter 13 that David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Do you know that that phrase, I have sinned, is only found some 20 times in all of God's word? And yet this man, that man that was after God's own heart, the Bible describes, here announces that sin. David, when the child is struck, begins to fast and for six days will not get off the ground, praying and hoping without food that God will change his mind. Let's take up reading verse 19 of 2 Samuel 12. So when David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him. And he ate, then his servants said to him, What is this you've done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I thought, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. This is what is referred to as a disenfranchised loss. A loss that re either is not readily understood because of the relationship or publicly known, or socially sanctioned. Imagine if there was a funeral that day going to be with the family and then say, now, which child did this belong to? 
oh, or about today, funerals of a homicide situation or funerals because of suicide. There are always innocent family people who are hurting in whatever situation there is. And so it's important that we show our love and care and concern for people regardless of the situation. Some years ago, there was a shooting in the Green Hill area, and the person that was shot by his wife was a son to two of our church members where I was the minister at North Carolina Church of Christ. They asked me to do the funeral. A lot of people were there because they wanted to know what's going to be said about the individual. At that time, of course, they had had no way of knowing exactly what had happened, only that there had been a shooting and that the man was dead. And so I got up and the first words that I said were, today we are here not to talk about how this person died, but how he lived. And then there were some things of a notable thing that we could say about him in regards to the life that he lived. It's just important that regardless of the reason for the death, that there are still innocent people that are hurting. Romans 12 verse 15 still says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and, not or, and weep with them that weep. And we need to do that. Go a few chapters to chapter 18 where we have another loss of a son of <clears throat> David. But this is Absalom, an adult, that chooses to rebel against his father, that takes over his kingdom, <clears throat> that forces David and his family to flee for their life. Blood is thicker than water, as the old saying goes. And so the end result was that David said, when the forces of Absalom were going to fight the forces of David, whatever you do, don't kill my son. But when he was fleeing, running from the enemy on some type of beast of burden, the Bible says that his head, literally his hair, got stuck in a tree. And somebody thrust him through with a spear and he died. And when the information comes back to David, then in verse 33, you hear the lament of any parent whenever they have to lose a child the Bible says in verse 33 of 2 Samuel 18, And the king was much moved and went up to his chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Too many times I've sat with family members who've had to endure the loss of a child, and those words would be very similar to that. Then we go to the book of Job. We're in the book of Job. We have a completely different situation. Job is one of the best men in all the people that live at that time. He is wealthy. He is prosperous. He's looked upon in a wonderful manner. And yet there is this meeting between God and Satan. And Satan, in essence, says to God, the only reason that Job is serving you because of all the things that you've given to him. You built a hedge around him. You not allowed any problems to come his way. Let me test him, and then let's see if he's going to serve you. And so in that story, that's exactly what takes place. And so in Job chapter 1, you begin to see the different losses, the losses of his commerce, the losses of his wealth. And then that terrible time where he hears the story about the ten children all together feasting, and a great wind comes and falls, the house falls upon them, they all die. And it's then and only then that you read in Job chapter 1, verse 20, these words. Then Job rose and tore his garment and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came out of my mother's womb. Naked I shall return. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Folks, we're on holy ground when we think about something of that nature. I don't know if my first thoughts over the loss of a child or a grandchild 
or someone even close to me would be to turn around and begin to worship God, begin to, to be thanking God for what had had. We often talk about Job in regards to his patience. I don't think the right word is patience. I think the better word is perseverance. Because as you continue through the book of Job, and we certainly don't have the time today to do so, you see that he has a lot of questions with God. He's wanting God to stand before him and to answer the questions that he had concerning all the losses that he had dealt with. Later on, there's the, the loss of his health from the bottom of his foot to the top of his head, sores and boils. Listen to what he said in Job chapter 13, verses 22 and 23, as he's talking to God. You call me and I will answer, or let me speak and you answer me. How many are my iniquities and sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. Why do you hide your face and hold me for your enemy? Job wanted to ask the question, why? It's a biblical question. He's not the first one to ask the question, and neither will he be the last one. Earlier in Scripture, in Judges chapter 6, Gideon asked that question. It's interesting that some of the first verses in the book of Judges tell us that God's people chose not to do His will. So God allowed other nations nearby to come and torment them, to cause them to turn back. So we know the reason why these problems were coming. It was in an effort to get the people to see and wake up and turn back to God. But Gideon didn't know that. And so he's hiding in a, in a wine press when an angel comes to him, calls him a mighty man of valor. And his response is found in Job, Judges 6, 13. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Now again, we know the answer because it tells us there in Judges 1, repeatedly, that God would use the other nations to get them to come back to him. But he wanted to know why. Job wanted to know why. Gideon wanted to know why. Our Lord wanted to know why. Remember that statement in Matthew 27, verse 46? Near the very end of his life, having been on the cross for some six hours, it says about the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, their day, he cried with a loud voice. He'd been on that cross Imagine the excruciating pain of having to push his feet against those nails in his feet to be able to lift his diaphragm to cry out these words to his father. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, the Aramaic language. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, we could spend so much time thinking about the ramifications of that statement. As a son of man, he felt the pain, the agony. He even didn't take the wine that would remove some of the pain when they offered it to him. But as the son of God, he also knew equally that there was only one who could atone for my sins and yours. It wasn't the blood of bulls and goats. It wasn't being good enough. It wasn't offering sacrifices all day long, every day of your life. It had to be Jesus. And yet, he expresses that statement to his father. I tell people it's okay to ask the question why, provided that your search for the answer leads you closer to God and not further away. Now, with that idea in mind, let's go to the New Testament in John chapter 11 that was read to us earlier. Because here in John chapter 11, we have deity's response to the death of humanity. 
Here in John chapter 11, we have our Lord. A Lord that according to Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 and 4, was despised and rejected of man. He's a man of sorrows. He's acquainted, the Bible says, with with grief. That's the way God wanted us to see Jesus. A man that dealt with sorrows every day. A man that lived with grief. Yet verse 4 says that he bore our sorrows and he carried our grief. As our big brother, he's willing to help us with the grief that we have to deal with. 700 years before his birth, Those are the words that God uses to describe our Savior, our Lord, our Master. We sometimes sing a song that asks the question, does Jesus care when my heart is pained? Too lonely for mirth or song? And you remember what the chorus says? Oh yes, He cares. I know He cares. His heart is touched with my grief. Here is deity's response to the death of humanity. We do have a high priest that cares for us. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, who is in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace so that we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here in John chapter 11, our Lord did four things. And if we can do those four things in response to the needs of others in regards to their grief, then we can learn some valuable lessons and we can be of some help to them. Number one, like Jesus, we need to be quiet. Look at what is said in verse 21 of John 11. And also verse 32. Martha comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 32. Martha says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you look at verse 22 and verse 33, you will find no response from Jesus. They knew Jesus cared. They had, in fact, sent a message to him because he was away from Bethany where they were. You do the the time frame, and by the time Jesus has gotten the message, Lazarus, his good friend, has already died. In fact, he says that there in John chapter 11. He makes that statement in verse 16. Lazarus is dead. And yet they had asked the question, Lord, where were you? If you'd have been here, this wouldn't have happened. Sometimes in the throes of grief, people will say things that they don't mean, but the emotions are raw, the pain is real. And so they just simply need someone to be there with them. Your presence means everything. It is not your words. It is your presence. In Vermont, I understand that they have the statement, don't ruin the silence unless you can improve on it. There's a time just to be quiet. The Joe Bailey family had seven children in their life. And sadly, three of those children died at separate times. On one occasion, as he's talking about the funeral visitation of one of his children, he tells about two visitors that came to visit. Both of them were ministers. One was a minister that just talked incessantly. He had answers for all his questions, even though they were few. He just talked about this and this and this and this and just kept on randomly talking. And as Joe Bailey said, he finally left and he was really glad that he had left. Then an older minister came in. He stood beside him quietly, talked quietly, sat beside him for an hour only responded whenever Mr. Bailey said something to him, but just sat there in his presence trying to help him with what he was going with. He said when he left, 
I was moved. I was touched. I wished he would have stayed longer, even though he was there for an hour. Sometimes people just need our presence, not our words, our presence. Secondly, like Jesus, we can be supportive. One of the few questions that he asked in all of this is found in verse 34. Where have you laid him? Jesus wanted to be with them in their circle of pain. And if we can do the same thing for people, we, can, we need to do that. And let's look and try to minister to all the family. Let's not forget the children. Because here's the rule of thumb. If you're old enough to love, you're old enough to mourn. A three-year-old can do that. And so let's not forget the, the, the children or the grandchildren or the great-grandchildren when someone dies because they too are hurting. They just may not be able to articulate it, but they still are hurting. That was their loved one. And so we need to look for them. And then in all the family, we need to look for everyone to minister to, especially those that we might call the strong ones. You say, well, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the person that often takes the lead. The person that everybody's looking to, the person that's, that's taking care of the family in regards to we're going to do this and this and this. And the end result is that sometimes people don't minister to their, his grief or her grief because of all the things that they're doing. And this story is interesting. Verse 20, when Martha goes to see Jesus, she goes alone. Yet look down at verse 31 concerning Mary. Then the Jews who were with Mary in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she's going to the tomb to weep there. There's a question here. Why did Martha go alone, even though there were people there in the house that could have gone with her? Martha always seems to be the one in lead. She may have been the older sister. We don't know. But when Mary goes, bless her heart, everybody sees the need to go with her. Often in a funeral situation, there is the strong one. And they too need comfort. For the last 31 years, I've taught a grief support class, typically 10 weeks in nature. We were talking about this very same thing because we spend a class on the Bible and grief. The next week after that discussion, a lady in that, my class wrote these words. I was the strong one. I planned my sister's funeral all by myself. I went and picked up my sister's ashes all by myself. I took to them the funeral home all by myself. When I crashed, I went all the way down to the bottom and there was no one there to pick me up. If you are the strong one, be sure that there is someone there to help you because it is lonely at the top. Like Jesus, we can be supportive. And then thirdly, like Jesus, we can be real. I want to ask for a show of hands, but when you were doing your memory work in Bible classes and you forgot to learn a memory verse, we all went back to John eleven thirty five, 35, didn't we? Jesus wept. Jesus cried. Study the tears of Jesus is a very interesting discussion. Because three times in Scripture it talks about the tears of our Lord. In Luke chapter 19, verse 41, He beholds the city of Jerusalem. And He cries over it because He knows that they're not going to follow His way ultimately. And that ultimately the Romans are going to come and destroy it as they did in AD 70. He also cried, perhaps in the Garden of Gethsemane, for you and for me. That's found in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, notice here, with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. 
Christ was praying for you and for me. He knew that he was the only atonement for the sins of mankind. He knew the terribleness of what that cross would be. He's crying as he's lamenting that choice. Remember? He had said, I can call and all kinds of angels will come and take me away and save me from this situation. He did that because of his love for you and because of his love for me. And then here he is crying for one person, a friend. A friend that he's about to bring back from death. I'd like to suggest that whenever we lose our loved ones, that our Lord cries for us as well because he feels that pain. We can do no greater thing than to cry with others. Men will later on talk about what women need to know about or what we need to know about women in grief. But I like the statement that someone made, I rarely cry like a baby, but I often cry like a man. It's okay to do so. Our Lord, the Son of God, the Son of Man, was willing to do so. And then finally, like Jesus, we can be empathetic. Notice verse 33 and also verse 38. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Verse 38, then Jesus again groaning in himself came to the tomb. He felt the loss. He felt the emotions that they had. He heard and saw their crying. He heard and saw their tears, the laments over the death of their beloved brother. That moved him. Sympathy is when we walk beside someone, but empathy is when we walk within someone. It's your pain in my heart. As someone said, when you cry, I taste the salt. How wonderful when you've got friends that are willing to be that way for you and with you. Sometimes people try to make judgments, particularly about deaths that we don't understand. The Indians say, I will not judge a man till I've walked two miles in his moccasins. There's a lot of worth and value in just holding our thoughts or our tongue and trying to be there with them and for them in their life. Does Jesus care? Oh, yes, he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. How wonderful it is that he has promised that even in the midst of our grief journeys, he's not going to leave us. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your manner of life be without covetousness. You be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you, so that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Whom shall I fear? What can man do unto me? This morning, do you have that hope that even in the midst of sorrows, your Lord is with you because of the life that you're living? Maybe you've not given your life to Christ. He wants to carry your sorrows. He wants to bear your grief. But you have to become a child of His by faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. Maybe in this audience, there are burdens that you just need to unload to your church family and allow them to pray with you. Or maybe there's sin in your life that separates you from him and from the church and you need to come back home. Whatever the case, a loving Savior who died for you, who loves you, invites you to come right now as we stand and sing.